So hello, Diane. Welcome to the Protect Accent interview. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, actually, Diane, and uh, I'm so honored um, to have you on this interview today. Um, and thank you for accepting the invitation to actually um, be part of this interview. Thank well, you very much. Well, to be honest, I think it's quite an important subject to talk about. And I think, um, as we've, we've, we have said before, um, I think other people are starting to talk about it and recognizing it. And if we don't do it now, then it's just going to lose momentum. So I think, you know, good on you for taking up the challenge of doing it. Thank you, Diane. Um, so I'd like to start by asking people to introduce themselves. Obviously, you are a very, very high um, HR consultant. And I'll give you the opportunity to please introduce yourself. Who is Diane Gracie? Who am I? Haha. <laughs> well, um, I run a HR consultancy uh, called Equilibrium Mediation Consulting. I'm also a managing partner for Synergize Solutions. And this is a, a new venture because we've started a, a new diversity program, which myself and my colleague um, have created together. So we wanted to make a difference in the DNI environment. So we created something that we think will really hit home with people. Um, yeah. I'm also the founder of the hashtag ethnicity pay cap movement, of which you are a member. Yes. Uh, and so uh, grateful to have you as a member, I would like to say. Um, an issue that I feel that really needs to be raised uh, regarding uh, pay between people who look like us and, yes. uh, and white people, to make it um, plain and simple. Yeah. Um, so I've been running that movement for about a year and a half, and um, I continue to do so because, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, and other people concerned, nothing has changed and we need to really push that issue. Mm. I'm also the author of a book called Business Culture Review, uh, which came out in January. And that is to do with uh, businesses' attitudes towards their own people. And, you know, it covers things like, um, you know, diversity, uh, people's behaviors and the, uh, and the way that they, they work within an organizational environment. Um, and I think it's a wonderful handbook for individuals who really want to have a somebody else's perspective um, mm -hmm. on what they believe um, organization behavior is at this moment. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's me in that show. Hopefully that didn't take up too much time. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Um, the topic of our interview today is improving job search outcome for ascended speakers. Um, it's an issue that actually um, is very personal to me on many levels. Um, a research found out that about 80% of employers admit to discriminating based on accent. So based on how you sound, you may or you may not get a job. You may or you may not progress in your career solely based on how you sound. It's a big issue. And I'm wanting to find out from you today, what can be done to improve the outcomes to employment and career for incentive speakers? People like me who have accents, what can be done to improve their job search outcomes and progress uh, in career? I, I think it's um, educating organizations um, to be a bit more open-minded and a bit more understanding that, you know, we all don't speak the same. Even if we were born here, we don't all speak the same. You know, yeah. you have regional accents, um, you yeah. know, you have accents, different accents within uh, local um, areas. So, you yeah. know, if you, if you live in Surrey, you might speak completely different from somebody who lives in South East London. You know, so yeah. it's about uh, acknowledging there are, there are differences and, and appreciating those differences and working um, in a way to bring people in because yeah. there's no reason why someone's accent should be a, uh, a barrier to stop them from getting specific employment. That one could argue that there could be some, you know, for example, if the accent is to a point that you can't, quite, you can't understand at all. So say for example, if you're a yeah. doctor yeah. and your accent is not clear enough to help a patient, that is different. Yeah. But yeah. on a general basis, I think people need to be a little bit understanding, a bit more thoughtful, and think about what, how you can utilize their accent to help others. So they might have uh, their client base, 
one would yeah. hope be quite broad. Yeah. So that person coming in could help to improve their client base. So think a bit more wider when it comes to trying to recruit people and not just stop and think, oh my God, you know, uh, that person's got an accent. Because, you know, these are barriers that we, we, we cannot afford. And then they start talking about a crisis in recruiting people. Well, if you start chopping and saying, oh, look, you know, I'm not going to take this person because they've got an um, a accent. I'm not going to take this person because it's black. I'm not going to take this person because they're disabled. It's not surprising, is it? Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's my thought on it. Yeah. Thank you very much. You touched on a very important thing there because you said that it is the responsibility of the speaker to make sure that they are speaking clearly to the point of being understood. Because that also is an issue and it brings a sort of balance to the whole argument. Yes. Because then on the one hand, people are being discriminated based on accent. On the other hand, are you speaking clear enough? Yes. So that is important as well. And uh, I'm an agitator for that. If you know you are in a region where you perhaps may not be understood clearly just based on the way you pronounce words, the responsibility, the onus is on you mm. to yourself sound very clearly. But in spite of that, and, and I'm not talking about um, elocution lessons here. No. I'm talking uh, because that is, is, is on a different level. Yes. So, but I'm talking about speaking clearly so yes. that people can understand you. So, but who should drive this uh, uh, when it comes to recruitment? Who should drive this change that we are, on, we are all um, on about? Who should drive the change for eliminating assentees basically in the workplace and in the whole of the recruitment process. Is, is it the assented speaker? Is it the organization? Who is responsible for, um, uh, for driving this change? I think it could, it's, a, it's a twofold, but I would say particularly organizations, um, because as I said previously, they need to be a bit more open and understanding and um, to embrace people with, with um, accents because you know that there are different accents as i said um, in in uh, the uk so you know if you've got a scottish accent that is very you know depending upon what part of scotland they come from can be difficult to understand so yeah. it's, it's about um appreciating that and at the end of the day you should be recruiting on ability yeah absolutely that ability so you know it's yeah. not about whether that person's got an accent so what is it what what are you recruiting for so let's be clear about that and then obviously, if, you know, the, the, in the recruitment, the, the businesses are doing their recruitment. At the agencies, again, I find are uh, also a, a big barrier because, yeah. if, for example, they, they want to speak to you about a job and they telephone you first. Yeah. They've immediately uh, put in their head, oh, no, I'm not going to put that person yeah. forward. And a lot of interviews are also done over the phone these days. Yes, exactly. So telephone, um, um, have a uh, job interview over the phone and they're offered a job right on the spot or declined right on the spot. So yeah. that has a massive impact because we all are aware that the call centers are very, very bad for ascentism, oh, to be honest. Because they want everybody to sound exactly the same. Yeah. So they want to have a, 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 a way that they want you to sound. They want you to sound in a particular way and that may have an impact. So, yeah. Carry on, sorry for butting in there. No, 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 not at all, not at all. And also, um, the person with the accent has a duty to be confident about what, you know, their ability is. To say, yeah. I might have an accent, but I could do this job. And, yeah. you know, to push back. For, for example, if you're going to get, if you get flimsy feedback, um, yeah. you need to push back and say, well, you know, actually I have, you know, all the criteria. Can you be a bit more specific as to why I haven't got the job? So, yeah. you know, I think there's an element of confidence needed for that person too. And I appreciate that, for example, if people have been pushed and shoved because of the accent for literally years, you're going to feel yeah. distressed and you're going to feel like, oh, I can't be bothered anymore to fight. But, you know, you need to try and build your confidence around the accent to be able to uh, uh, raise yourself and say, I'm as just as good as everybody else, quite frankly. And, you know, your attitude is the one that needs to be fixed, not my accent. And leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, that is quite interesting. When you touched on the point that ascented speakers need to build their confidence, yes, because it's an issue. Yes. If you've been knocked down a number of times, 
it's bound to aff affect your confidence. Yep. So can we do, what, what do we do? How do we get back up then? Um, I know I'm going to do an interview on resilience and ascentism. And yes. um, that's an interview, but um, from your point of view, what can ascentist speakers do to build that resilience and the confidence to actually go back to the organization and say, actually, can you give me more details on this feedback? Because I think I did very well on the interview. And to be honest, they are not going to tell you that, oh, but because of your accent, we cannot accept you. They will find other reasons around oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They'll just, they'll just say, uh, unfortunately, uh, we met uh, somebody who met the criteria slightly better than you. There will always be a way out of it. But the key is to push back because the, even though the result may be that you still don't get the job, you've done it. Yeah. yeah. And you continue to do it. And then yeah. that builds your confidence. Yeah, and absolutely. Also, we're talking about what else is to have support around you. Um, yeah. being your family or at, you know externally um, get support for, um, from somebody like myself or someone else who can yeah. just talk to you have a conversation yeah. with you and just give yeah. you examples of what you can do and yeah. you know, people you know maybe they should be and maybe this is something for you have a workshop a group of people with accents and get them all together yeah and get you know talk about the, the challenges that have happened and you know, start talking about it because what is uh, what I believe is happening or has happened is that people who've had this discrimination haven't talked about it. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not talking about it. You're doing. You're putting it all internally. Yeah, yeah. So you need absolutely. To get that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm finding that that is true. What you said. People even now are still very reluctant to talk about it. Because absentism is not tangible, it's not visible, it's yeah. not like uh, racism, it's not like uh, uh, gender discrimination, it's yeah. just not like, it's just something that you can't see. Yeah. People are thinking, nobody's going to take me seriously. Yeah. Well, that is why the uh, Protect Accent interview was initiated in the first place, to yeah. bring this to the limelight, so yeah. that organizations would realize that actually there is a problem here that needs to be fixed. I'm talking about organization. A lot of workplace culture uh, is very toxic yes. to people with accent. Yes. What do you think that can be done to drive positive organizational change in terms of organizational culture and behavioral change for teammates? Well, I think the best way is to try and get people with accents more involved with things uh, involving speaking, um, you know, doing small pers um, per presentations, sorry, or, you know, giving a workshop, but elevate it. You need to try to elevate them so they can be seen. Yeah. And thus, you're giving them confidence. And so yeah. as an organisation, you're showing that you are not discriminating, sorry, against accent because you're allowing these people to speak. Not just to yeah. one, you know, it's something that you need to be encouraging quite regularly. And yeah. team meetings, ensure that the person with the accent is speaking. So you're yeah. bolstering co confidence and you're yeah. showing that, you, you know, you are being considerate rather than speaking to or encouraging people who don't speak like you. Yeah. That is, I, I think, is the way forward. That's, 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 that's very good. And for the Ascentist speaker out there, be bold, be confident, and express yourself. Mm. Long as you speak clearly and you can be understood, that's all you need. You don't need any actual lessons. And I want to add a little bit more thing to what you said there, because you actually mentioned so many important points, and I just want to add a little bit to it. I want organizations, if possible, to create policy that will protect ascented speakers. Mm. Because if it's not in the policy, then there's nothing to hold on to. There's yeah. nothing to go by. But if, that, if, if you put it all on that of how bullying and harassment, unconscious bias, yeah. what is that then? Unconscious bias entails a lot of things. So it creates that room for people to wriggle out of Ascentism, really. But if you focus on it, create policy that will include or that will bar people from um, discriminating on others based on their accent, I think that will have an impact as well. Yeah, you're, uh, you're absolutely right. And one thing you were talking about unconscious bias, um, 
when I was talking about my program at the, that we've created, we focus yeah. on, we no, focus on, on inherent bias. So we yeah. believe that it's because you, your behaviours are, are formed when you're in a family group, as you grew up, yeah. at school, and the people you surround you. So that's what we talk about. So you, you know, the program makes you have to deal with the issue rather than yeah. talking around it. Yeah, so absolutely. Think, and as what you said is absolutely right. You need to address it, and um, you know, putting it in in policy um, or or in you know your mandate is part of your DNI. You're saying we will yeah. not will not accept people discriminating against people with accent. Yeah, That's, yeah. yeah, that would be really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's an initiative coming up which I have tagged the um, Accent Charter mm. that I would love organisations to sign on to. Yes. Just to say that they are agreeing not to discriminate anyone based on their accent. Well, we'll see how that goes. Well, thank you for the interview. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to, 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 to interrupt. I think that's a great idea. That's yeah. That's a great idea. And, um, yeah. I, you know, if once you uh, do do that, share it out. I will share it to everybody because I think it's, that's a very good idea. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. Thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of this interview today. It's been lovely having you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.